So today I'd like to tell you a little story about the number E. Uh, e feels like sort of the randomest thing when you first learn about it. Um, but then if you sort of persist with math, uh, it just keeps coming up and over and over again. And so by the time you get to calculus, uh, it seems like it's, it's one of the most important numbers ever. And in fact it is. Um, whether you're looking at e or its cousin natural log, which is, is sort of the inverse function, but based on e, uh, the version of, of logarithms that involves e, um, it turns out to be sort of the this straight and narrow line in the world of calculus. Um, and it seems like, how can a number that sort of came up out of nowhere and felt totally random how could it be so important later on? And I think one of the things that makes us feel that way is the way that we get introduced to E. Um, this is the definition that I think most people get for E in school. And then it's sort of no surprise that people don't connect it to anything because it's pretty mysterious. So the, the school definition gives E as a limit. So as N gets really, really big, this expression supposedly gets closer and closer to the number E. And then this, this defines E. Now, for anyone who's not used to it, this looks really, really random and like alphabet soup and you can't make anything of it. Um, but even people who remember sort of what was going on in school the day when this thing came up have a hard time making anything of it when they get to the other ways that E comes up in like calculus and stuff like that. Um, so this, this comes up in the course of learning about compound interest usually. And this expression here is random as it might look to other people. For people who study compound interest, oh, that looks kind of like compound interest. Um, and so one way to describe it is this is what compound interest looks like when you compound it continuously. You also might ask, why would such a seemingly like niche topic as compounding interest continuously have such a fundamental role in all of calculus? Um, and that even understates it a little bit. For people who stick with math even longer, the, the fundamental or central role that E plays in everything turns out to only get bigger over time. Um, so what I want to do today is to give you another definition of E that's sort of the right definition. Um, I mean, not that, that any one definition is any more correct than the others, but at least a definition that will be easier to make sense out of when you say to yourself, what is E? And then how do you, you know, coordinate that with the things that E is doing in, in the world that you're working in? It makes a lot more sense than this. And to get us started, I want to dig into this, this claim I made that, that E in this definition doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, we can all see that it looks like gobbledygook, but I, I mean, let's take, let's take another number that's sort of complicated. So that pi, we all know that if we write that out those decimal digits, we're going to have to keep going. And there's no pattern that's going to make sense of them for us. Uh, so pi is in a lot of ways sort of a complicated number. But in terms of its definition, when you say what is pi, it's very simple. Take a circle, take its circumference, measure it, divide it by the, the diameter of that circle, you've got pi. That's its definition. It makes some obvious sense in terms of a, a basic geometric figure. We don't get quite that lucky with E. Um, but in the same way, we might want to sort of have a sense of knowing what we feel like it is, and then also, if we ever need to use it, knowing around how big it is. So how could you look at this and get a sense for how big E is? It's kind of hard, even if you're familiar with limits. So the idea of a limit is that as you keep get, giving me bigger and bigger ends, I can plug them in, and what I get when I plug n in and do the algebra should be pretty close to the eventual number e. But plugging in bigger and bigger n's here is hard. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
you have to know a lot more about limits to be able to do that than you know just sort of looking. Um, if I plug in big big numbers here then I have one divided by a really big number. That's a really tiny fraction. As n gets bigger, that's going to get closer to zero. Um, and this is how this is the kind of plugging in and thinking about limits that most of us will learn how to do over the course of a calculus class, let's say. And so one plus a really tiny fraction is just pretty much about one. And then I'm going to take that number and I'm going to raise it to bigger and bigger and bigger numbers. And so that seems like raising one to bigger and bigger and bigger numbers, but I know that raising one to any power is just one. So from that way of thinking about it, it seems like e should be one. And then in that case, what's the big deal? Now let's think about it from the other direction. Um, whatever it is, this is gonna be a number that's bigger than one. And if I have a number that's bigger than one, and I raise it to a power, a power that's bigger than one, you know, if I square it, if I cube it, if I raise it to the fifth, that's, that number's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that way of thinking about it, it seems like this number could be infinity because I just keep raising it to bigger and bigger and bigger powers. That doesn't, neither, those give me two disagreeing answers. And then also, if I'm gonna say that the truth lies somewhere in between, well, that says that E might be something between one and infinity, not a lot of help. There's also things that come up in calculus, like that e is a very special number. It's the number such that when you make the function e to the x and you take its derivative, you get exactly e to the x back. Um, e to the x is the easiest question to ask on a derivative test, let's say. It's the most boring thing from the point of view of derivatives, but also kind of the most amazing thing, a function that is its own rate of change. That's kind of cool. Um, but if I have to go to this definition to figure out what E is, why, trying to believe this fact is pretty hard to imagine. I'm just going to take the teacher's word for it and move on. So anyway, I don't like that definition of E to the X or of E. And so what I wanted to show you today is a different definition that's easier to make sense of. And at least in my head, when I think about E, I think, oh, that's E. So uh, let me show you now. So for me, E is 1 plus 1 plus 1 half plus 1 sixth plus 1 20th plus 1 over 120, on and on and on. Now those numbers might seem a little bit random when I write it this way, but when I write it this way, it maybe makes a little bit more sense. Now this is a very informal way to write this. Most people wouldn't write it down that way. They would write it down either as this, or a very compact and fancy way. Now, if these giant sigmas and the, the indices and the, the subscripts and the superscripts start to make you hyperventilate, uh, I will encourage you to stick with things. Once you learn this way of writing things down, it feels really cool to be able to do it. Um, and it also feels like something that previously felt very intimidating can be within your wheelhouse. And all it is is a notational shorthand. This big sigma means I add some things together. And writing things down this way is faster and easier than writing down that way. The other benefit is when I write it down this way, one over zero factorial looks like a really problematic fraction. Um, and maybe you're not even familiar with factorials. So maybe I should say something there. Um, let's take one over four factorial. 
4 factorial. That's how I say this, by the way. It's not excited for or anything like that. Um, this is a shorthand. It says take all the numbers, the counting numbers, that come before 4 and multiply them together. So 4 times 3 is 12, times 2 is 24, and so I should have written down 24 up there. Shows you how well I have this form internalized in my head that I wrote it down the wrong way up there. So that's what a factorial is. You multiply all the numbers leading up to that number. Um, so zero factorial, well, what are all the numbers leading up to zero? Uh, it doesn't make sense, does it? So because we want this compact formula to work out, mathematicians decide that zero factorial is by definition equal to one. Everything works out nice when we define it that way, and we get to make the rules, so we define it that way. Um, one factorial is obviously one, two factorial is one half, and so it doesn't matter if you write down one half or one over two factorial, they're the same thing, and you'll see them sort of interchanged a lot, at least in my writing. Um, so a lot of those little like messy edge details and stuff aren't as obvious when you write it down that way, which is another reason to use it. So you sort of uh, prevent questions that you don't really want to deal with and that don't end up being interesting. So that's my definition of E though. So one and one and one half and one sixth and one twenty fourth, not one twentieth, and one over one twenty. Um, that is my definition for E. Um, right away, there's some things we can pick out about it that are a little bit better than the other definition of E. Um, for instance, how big is E? Well, it's one and one, so there's two, and then a half, and then some other little bits. Now you might say that, okay, I'm adding infinitely many things together, so maybe E is just infinity all over again. Um, and if you haven't spent a whole lot of time adding infinitely many things together, it can feel problematic. Um, but we are all familiar with ways in which we add things together infinitely many times and end up with a finite amount. We just don't think about it. So our decimals are an instance of doing this. When we write out pi as 3.1.1459 on and on and on, what we're doing is we're saying three and a tenth and four one hundredths, and a certain number of one thousandths, and a certain number of ten thousandths. And it's not just for numbers like pi that go on forever in this weird way, but a number like a third. A third is three tenths, and three one hundredths, and three one thousandths, and three ten thousandths, on and on and on and on. All those discrete numbers added together to make this number that is, is in a lot of respects very simple, one third. Take a pi and divide it into three pieces. Um, but from the point of view of decimals, you've got to write it out forever. So in general, there's nothing really all that strange about adding infinitely many things together and getting a number that's smaller than infinity. The real trick is that if you're going to keep adding, the things you're adding have to get tiny. And factorials get big really fast, meaning that when they're in the denominator, those, those fractions get tiny very, very fast. Um, and we can see, you know, if you write out any of these correctly or incorrectly, as I usually do, um, you see that they, they get really tiny really fast. So we can expect that the part that I haven't written about E to not matter very much when we're asking around how big is E. So E is a little bit bigger than two and a half. And if you want to get a little bit better of an approximation than that, then figure out what a half plus a sixth is and decide it's that. Um, this definition of E is very good for knowing around how big it is, and if you need to get a better sense of how big it is, you can keep going. We might try and find a convenient infinite series for pi, in case you needed to know decimal digits of pi, but most people already know in their head enough decimal digits of pi to get by in pretty much any sort of practical situation. So maybe there's not that much need for it. The next thing I want to show you is how you can use this number E to define the function e to the x.
So let's write it down. Let's write e as the fancy way. The sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. Now if you've ever seen power series before, this will feel like a very natural thing to do, what I'm about to do. If you've never seen them before, it'll look arbitrary, and so I can't really do anything about that, except to begin to tell you the usefulness of power series. So, in general, um, a power series is like a decimal, but for functions. So, if you can make any number we want out of a decimal that goes on long enough, you can make a function out of a polynomial that goes on long enough. So powers of x. So we describe power series in terms of this many constants plus this many first powers of x plus this many second powers of x, on and on and on. This infinite polynomial to describe a function. And that's what power series are. Um, so e to the x, you just turn e into a power series in the simplest way you could possibly imagine. Also, if you spend any time with power series, you're used to seeing this one over n factorial part of them. It's just something that, that is always there or almost always there. Um, and if you do a little bit of calculus, you'll begin to see why, why it's there. Um, but that's what e to the x is. So if I want to write it out the long way instead of the fancy way, e to the x is my n equals 0. So I plug that in, and I remember that 0 factorial is 1. Um, and then x to the 0 is 1. So I get 1, and then I plug in n equals 1, and I get 1 for the fraction part again, and I get x to the 1. So 1 plus x, and then I'm going to get x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the 4th over 4 factorial, on and on and on. Also, if you imagine we don't do this whole business of trying to translate from the sigma notation, and you know that a power series is supposed to be this infinite polynomial that you write out in terms of increasing powers of x. Um, this is, again, the most obvious simple power series you could possibly imagine. And as directly related to this one, as uh, this series for e, as it could be. So every place I have a, a number, I just plug in a higher power of x, and that power of x goes along with the factorial part. So that's what e to the x is. Um, this is tremendously useful, this idea here. Because, well, let's just do some calculus with it. The first thing you learn how to do in calculus is to take the derivative, which we often write d dx of the function. So if I want to, the first thing you learn how to do in calculus is to take the derivative of a simple polynomial, x to the power n and you are forced or failed if you don't learn, but you're forced to learn that this is n x to the n minus one. There's this little sort of dance move where you pull the power down and then you put a power up there that is one smaller. So if I want to take the derivative of a power series, I just have to take the derivative of each little bit of the polynomial one by one by one. Ultimately, there's a lot of like um, questions about convergence and, and sort of if infinity gets in the way that the people who are inventing calculus couldn't have cared less about. Um, but over a course of about 200 years, other people worried about and got pedantic about mostly because they had to teach calculus classes. And so they, they sort of came up with some more red tape for mathematicians to have to go through to be able to do this. But for a function like e to the x, e to the x is so nice that you don't have to worry about it. So if I want to take the derivative of e to the x, all I got to do is go bit by bit by bit by bit using this rule. Derivative of 1 is 0, derivative of x is 1, derivative of x squared is 2x, derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, 
And then if I do a little bit of algebra, I'll notice that that two cancels with the two there. Three cancels with the three there, leaving two factorial. So I get one and x and x squared over two factorial. And sure enough, x cubed over three factorial. The derivative just knocks off that extra, the very last bit of the factorial on and on. And I get e to the x right back from taking the derivative. So very quickly from this definition of e to the x, from this definition of e, we get the central fact that e to the x is the special function that is its own derivative. So that's the first reason to like this definition. Well, maybe the second, because we know how big e is. Um, the other thing that might take a while, and you might never do enough math to capitalize on, but if you do, it's out there waiting for you, is that it turns out that this definition of e to the x makes sense in much broader contexts than the one we're using it now. Right now we're sort of imagining that x is a real number that we plug in, like 5 or 17 or pi or e itself, but a real number that gets plugged into this. And then we can estimate around how big that number is by approximating using this, this series here. Um, but it turns out very quickly that you can also plug complex numbers in there. And that makes sense. And that leads to its own beautiful fact that everyone likes to talk about that maybe I'll talk about later. Um, but it also works for x to be, let's say, a matrix. And not only does it work, but it ends up being of fundamental importance to the spaces that are created by matrices. Um, it tends to be, it turns out to be uh, this central fact about how these spaces work. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a new definition for E, that it's one and one and a half and a sixth and a 24th and a 120th, on and on and on, that there's a simple way to write it out and that by using that definition of E, we can get a much better sense of, of feeling what E is about. So uh, I hope this is uh, just the beginning of us digging into the stories and the, the characters of the numbers that, that we know, and then learning about numbers that, that we don't know, and getting a strong feeling for them. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you again soon.